Thank you for being present here in person, uh, joining us online, even watching back later. We're super grateful. Uh, we know how valuable our time is, and thank you for prioritizing this time that we have together. Uh, so this morning, I have been praying for us, and I've been praying this week that God would really speak to us a word that we need to hear this morning, one that would awaken our hearts, that would stir our minds, that would renew us, refresh us, rejuvenate us, and be exactly what we need to hear. I'm absolutely convinced that I can say whatever I say up here and we can hear nothing. But if the Spirit of God speaks something powerfully into our hearts, it will stick with us heavily. I often talk with people after the service and they mention things from the sermon. And a lot of times what people say, I think, you know, I didn't really say that, but I know God spoke that through what I said. And so I've been praying for us to hear from the Lord this morning and that this would really be a time of renewal and refreshing and reorientation towards God. So we're continuing in our series this morning, going through the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. This is a book that most churches won't touch, so I'm really glad that we're going through it. It's a book that as I'm preparing and studying for, I'm both thinking, why are we doing this? This is so difficult. Why did we choose this? And I'm so glad we chose this. This is so good and it's so deep. We chose this book because this has been a season especially focused on reflecting on what is the point of my life? Where do I find value and meaning and purpose? What really matters? What am I doing with my life? And Ecclesiastes is a reflection on those very questions. And so I think it's incredibly relevant for our time together this morning and this summer as we're looking through it. We've titled this series Meaningless because we really think that all these sermons are just meaningless. So you guys can go home. Thank you for being here. No, we've titled this sermon meaningless because almost every chapter has this Hebrew word, havel, which means meaningless. It means a vapor or a smoke. It's the illusion of substance. It seems like something is there, but when you get there, it's not. It's like a mirage. It seems like there is something that matters that we go after, but when we grab a hold of it, there's nothing to grab a hold of. And uh, King Solomon, who we believe wrote and said most of what's in this book, basically spends the whole book looking at wisdom really matters. It's very important. But in the end, it doesn't give us purpose. It doesn't give us uh, what really matters. It's meaningless. King Solomon accomplished many great things in his lifetime. He built wonderful things. He had all sorts of relationships. He had tons of wealth. He had it all. He lived it up. And in the end of his life, he says, it was all for nothing. It was all meaningless. Why? Because it all goes away. It's all temporary. Everything in this life is fleeting and is only temporary. And some of the conclusions that we get to in this book are basically looking at how the only thing that really matters is living with and for God all the days of our lives. That is the only way we can find true value, meaning, and purpose. And so chapter five kind of takes a little bit of a turn. And rather than saying, get wisdom, nah, it's meaningless. Hey, build stuff, nah, it's meaningless. Have some amazing experiences. No, it's meaningless. Chapter five goes in to basically talk about worship and authentic worship and true worship. Because one of the conclusions of Ecclesiastes is to live with and for God every day, and that's where we find our meaning and value, King Solomon really tar targets inauthentic worship. There's a lot of people who consider themselves religious, who check off the box of maybe Christian or spiritual um, in, on, at the hospital or, or on a form, right? But a lot of people who are just going through the motions of religion, who identify with a people group but don't actually live it out. And that's who King Solomon is targeting today. Really saying that we can't just go through with this empty religious mindset going through the motions of tradition that we've inherited, but we need to be intentional to seek out the true and living God in an authentic way in our everyday lives. And so that's what the sermon is about today. And we're gonna walk through verse by verse, the first seven verses of chapter five, to look at how King Solomon tells us we need to live out this authentic worship. So my hope for this morning is that we'd really experience renewal. Let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We pray that you would have your way in us. We open up our mind, our eyes, our ears to hear from you, to see you more clearly. And we pray that you would speak to us, God. We are giving you our full attention. 
We want to receive from you and hear from you. Would you do a transformational work in us in this moment that carries on through all of our days this week and this month and this year and in all of our lives? So we thank you that you are good. We thank you that you are always pursuing us, that you are faithful to us, and that you love to get to know us and care for us and welcome us into your family. We give you glory and praise. And all God's people said, amen, amen. All right, so this morning we're going to start off by going out through uh, verse 1. And so verse 1 says this, Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know what they do wrong or that they do wrong. And so let me give us a little history and context here. In King Solomon's day, there was one temple. This is the main temple. It, this is where it was believed that the presence of God dwelt on the earth was literally in this temple, in the Holy of Holies, okay? So if people wanted to make a sacrifice, they wanted to make um, some sort of vow or some sort of commitment, they would come to this temple and they would worship God at this location. They didn't do it elsewhere, but they really came together at this specific location, so they would come to the temple and they would make this vow and do these sorts of things. And so that's why Solomon's first piece here is he's saying, he's not talking about temple worship. He's saying, guard your steps. So first thing is your life outside of the temple should look like worship, okay? Uh, it's not just like, hey, go to the temple, do your worship thing, and then leave the temple and forget about God. Our whole lives, every day, every minute, every breath should be focused on giving God worship. The term Sunday best developed when a church culture kind of rose up where it was believed that in order to truly worship God, you needed to wear your best clothes, you needed to put on your best smile and your best face, and you needed to come to church and put your best foot forward. It was believed that that's what authentic worship was, really giving God your best. But what we found over time is it only encouraged worship, worshipful attitudes in the church building, but outside it wasn't the case. And there's many kids who grew up in families where they experienced mom and dad or brother and sister or pastor or church members who were really great on a Sunday morning, but when they went home were rude and horrible and aggressive and angry and not Christ-like. In fact, a lot of people have seen this attitude and have called attention to it and called out this hypocrisy that there is a temptation for Christians to show up and put on their best at church, but then to go home and to not live it out authentically. And King Solomon is calling us to live it out authentically. Now, Sunday Best is not only a hit song right now, well, maybe it's kind of faded, um, but it is an attitude that we, if we're not careful, we can put on our best foot forward and then not be consistent. Instead of our Sunday best, we need to put on our everyday best. We need to be Christ-like and God-honoring and in all of our days throughout the week. The second thing that Guard Your Steps really points at is that when we attend worship services, we need to be prepared. Now, my wife and I, we were blessed enough to get to go to the movies this last Friday, uh, two days ago. It was our first time to the movies in probably like a year and a half, and we saw Black Widow. Anybody see Black Widow? Any fans out there? Okay, a few of us. Woo. Wow. No, apparently no. Check it out. I think it was good. I think you can watch it online too. We enjoyed it. It was worth watching. We liked it. It didn't change my life, you know, but uh, it was good. It was quality. But to our surprise, we were the only ones in the theater. So we got to choose whatever seat. You know, people are paying big bucks to rent out entire theaters to be COVID safe and COVID friendly. So that way it's just them and their family. We just got it for the, the simple admission price. So it was just us. And it was a lot of fun. But over the years, my philosophy of film attendance has changed. And this is what I mean. When I was younger, maybe high school, college, I discovered something. The movie theater would say the showtime starts at 6. But let's be honest. What time is that movie really starting? 6.20. Maybe even 6.25. You know, so I learned, uh-huh, look at all these foolish people around showing up so early 
and I'll just roll in at 625 and I'll be fine. I can skip all those boring previews, right? Well, there were a few times where I did that and I missed the first five minutes of the movie. And if you've missed the first five minutes of a movie before, sometimes you can be completely lost. In film theory, and film production, within the first 10 minutes of a film, you want to present not only the setting, but the problem. There's a problem presented, and then the whole rest of the film will be spent basically solving that problem. Think about any movie that you like. That's pretty much every movie I just summed up right there. Here's a problem. Oh, no, how will we solve it? Oh, you just have to go here. Oh, no, that got thrown off. That's not going to work. We have to do this instead. Oh, another turn of events, and then it all comes together in the end, right? That's every movie. And so what happens is, basically, um, in this, or what I, what I discovered was that it wasn't worth missing the first five minutes of the movie. And if I showed up early, like I'm talking like 5.45 early, I could get some concessions, some popcorn. I could take my time and stroll in. I could like do a little research on my phone about the movie, be ready for it. I could enjoy the previews. And by the time the movie starts, I'm relaxed. Most of my popcorn's already gone. Somehow I eat it in the first 10 minutes. And I'm just ready to enjoy the experience. And in my older, wiser years, I've learned I actually prefer that better, that I was cheating myself. Because going to a movie, being prepared, being ready to engage, being rested and ready to just enjoy the experience, I, didn't, I wasn't stressed, I wasn't anxious, I was ready to go. And the same thing is being said here by King Solomon about times of worship. You see, for some of us, we're showing up late to church, we just barely got here, we fought with the family on the way in, we're trying to make plans with people via text before we get here, we're showing up disheveled and stressed and worried, and then it's like, great are you, Lord, yeah, all right, God, right? And we're just coming in. Now, I am not saying if you were late this morning, shame on you, I am not saying that, okay, shame on you, okay, I am not saying if you are running late to church, don't show up. No, don't ever do that. Come late, right? I had a, a former youth group student that literally, it would be the end of the sermon, thank you, Lord, for being here, and I see him like walking through the doors, right? And uh, so still come. I never want to discourage anyone from coming into church, right? And I've been there. I was on staff working at this church. They were paying me, and I was late to this church when I first started working here. So I know what it's like to be guilty of that. I know the stress of getting three young kids ready. Actually, my wife knows more of that stress. Thank you, baby, for taking care of that this morning. But what I am saying is there is a completely different experience when we are rushed in, stressed out, late, throwing ourselves in, and it takes to the end of the worship service before we go, Oh, yeah, God. Okay, cool. Oh, oh, it's already over. But if we are prepared, if we are ready, if we are postured to come in and to experience God, we will get so much more out of this. So some of the things I like to do on Sunday mornings, I like to listen to worship music in the shower on the way here. I like to be in prayer. God, would you speak powerfully through this service? Speak to me. I'm already preparing my heart. I'm already preparing my mind. I'm already expecting God to move. I'm getting here early, partly because I work here and I've got to preach, so I've got to get ready, but partly because I want to be prepared. So that once the service begins at 10 o'clock, because we start this thing at 10, like it is 10 sharp, like 9.59, 59, go. Welcome to new life. Like that's how we are. I, being prepared, get so much more out of the service, and I'm so much more prepared to give God worship. It helps me to posture my worship towards God rather than to receive. One of my biggest critiques of worship in our modern day environment is a lot of our songs say I, me, us, we, There's a lot of the songs that are like, God, in your presence, it's just so amazing. I just love it. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Yay, right? And it's very us-focused. But worship at its heart is God-focused, is God-centered, is meant to give him praise. And oftentimes, I talk with people, and you can just tell our language is so self-centered. And this is me included. But we are very concerned with our own experience, our own feeling, our own thought, I've talked to people who have come to church and decided not to return, and it's like, I didn't really get what I needed for this moment for me. And the challenge is, this wasn't about you. This was about God all along. 
Now, if we truly make it about God, he loves us so much that he blesses us in return. And like, that's how it works. But if we're just coming to worship to just get something out of it, and we're missing the whole point of worshiping God, then maybe we've missed the point. So moving on, the next part of this verse in verse one um, says, uh, it talks about the fool. And it talks about the fool, let's see, what does it say here? It says, uh, um, offering says, go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know what they do wrong. And so there's a warning here, don't offer the sacrifice of fools. And this is the sacrifice of fools. People in King Solomon's day were showing up to the temple They were offering a sacrifice, which is what was commanded, for forgiveness of sins. But they had no idea what their sins were. They didn't know what they did wrong. They didn't know what they were asking for forgiveness for. They were just doing this out of ritual and habit. They were just going through the motions because that's what they were told to do. That's what they grew up doing. That's what they thought they were supposed to do. And it was just dead. And so we are warned here, do not be like the fools who show up to worship and have no idea what they're doing or why they're doing it, who are just expressing and, oh, we're raising a hand now, okay, cool, oh, I just go to church. If your answer for why do you go to church is because, or I'm supposed to, or that's what I've always done, then maybe that's a hint that there's something that we're missing, because we should be intentional about coming here to worship God to engage in a life-giving, lifelong, daily relationship with him, and Sunday is just part of it. So that's what Solomon is getting at here. And so this is the big concern. One of the things that Solomon is speaking to us is, are you just going through the motions? Are you just participating in church or scripture or prayer out of habit or out of ritual or out of tradition? Now, anything in this life that we do for long enough will just become that. Think about a relationship you're in. Maybe it's a marriage. Maybe it's with a friendship. Maybe it's a job or a workplace. Maybe it's where you live or your community. Maybe it's your faith. Everything that we do after a while, if we are not careful and intentional, will just become routine. And when it becomes routine, it can suck the life out of it. We can forget why we're doing it in the first place, and it's on the road to being dead. I love getting a chance to perform wedding ceremonies. Yesterday, I was able to marry Ryan and Paris, uh, who were in our life group for a little bit, and I love getting to do it. One of the things that I can't help but reflect on as I am telling everyone what marriage is about is my own marriage. And so I'm up there saying, marriage is this, and you're supposed to be loving, and you're supposed to do this, and we love each other because we love God, and I can't help but think, am am I doing this? (laughs) There's all these promises, 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient and kind. I wasn't patient today. I wasn't as kind as I should have been. But I'm reminded, every time I perform a wedding ceremony, every time we attend a wedding, we are reminded of what marriage is supposed to be. We're reminded of the vows that we made and we're encouraged to keep living that. And so this reminder helps us to keep that going. So what is it for us this morning? Where are we just going through the motions? In our faith, in our life, in our relationships, at work? Where are we dead inside? Where have we learned to smile and and keep it going and put on our Sunday best, but inside we've grown dead and we've grown dim? Where does God need to renew our hearts and our minds this morning to come to life, to be and do how he's called us to be? So let's move on to verse two. Verse two starts to break down a little bit more detail of kind of how to approach God humbly. And it's, it's with humble listening. Verse two says this, do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. In order to have genuine, authentic, and engaged worship, we need to be quick to listen, not to speak. Quick to understand and quick to reflect. It's not just about having an outward appearance of looking like we know what we're doing, but an inward, authentic reflection. And I've learned, this has been something I've had to learn, but to be slow to speak. I have always been quick to speak in my whole life. I've been so quick to speak that I often talk like I know what I'm talking about when I really don't and I'm just making it up. I'm not doing that right now, by the way. This is all very good, true, theological stuff. 
But growing up, somebody would say, oh, have you been to the aquarium lately? And have you? And I would just thought, oh, yes, aquariums are great. Did you know that they get the fish from this location? Did you? And I'm just making stuff up. I just wanted to sound like I knew what I was doing, but I didn't know. And sometimes people believe me, like, wow, kid, you're really knowledgeable. And some kids would be like, actually, my mom works for the aquarium, and none of that's true. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, well, I read that somewhere, so they must have got it wrong. Um, but if we're going to come into authentic worship, we have to have a humble posture of listening, hungry to receive and hear from the Lord, ready to receive whatever he has for us. I remember when I was first a youth pastor, uh, this is probably about eight years ago, I was hired as, at this church. I had only actually been to a youth group one time in my life, my senior year of high school with a friend. So I didn't really know what to do uh, as a youth pastor. I didn't really know what a youth group was supposed to be. Uh, it's for, supposed to be for middle school and high school students and help them grow in their faith. And so I decided to visit some other local churches to kind of see like what they did and how they had a youth group and what they did. And so I remember going to a church and it was fun and exciting and they had games and there were leaders and they interacted with the students and they had music and teaching and all these things. And I was really excited and inspired and I learned a lot. But one thing really stood out to me. It came time for the worship time. There was a whole band up there and there, there had to be a hundred students, something like that. And as soon as the worship team started, like 80 of the 100 students all moved to the front. They all started raising their hands and swaying. And I just thought, wow, how did they do that? How did they get these kids to be so involved and so engaged? I was over here leading my little youth group of a dozen kids, and during worship time, it was like this. I'm like, let's sing, let's really sing, guys. Super quiet, you know? And then occasionally you would hear like a, you know, I think I heard something. I think I heard something. You know, the, the, the worship leader would go like, all right, just the voices. And it would be like, okay, let's keep singing. And so I thought, this youth group has just got it going on. I wish, I wish my group was like this. I, I want to learn. But what I realized was that these kids, I saw some of them who it was so clear that they were just going through the motions. And this is how I knew. For three songs, for 15 minutes, they had the same exact wave and sway, okay? Didn't matter if the tempo of the song changed. Didn't matter. They just did this for 15 minutes straight. And I looked at some of their faces, and this is super judgmental, I know. But I looked at some, and they just did the same thing for the whole 15 minutes, and I know from being a part of worship songs that one song I might be like, ooh, yeah, there's a hand there. Another song, it's like, I'm thinking on this one. Another song, I'm like, I'm just going to sit on this one. And maybe that's just because I'm super antsy. But generally, as the lyrics change, my thoughts change, my posture change, my singing style changes. But I noticed that they were just going through the motions. And I thought, oh, at first it seemed like they really had this vibrant passionate relationship with God, but I think some of these kids are just going through the motions. They've learned the right things to say, the right way to sway, and the right things to do, but inside, they might just possibly be dead. And then I noticed in the back row, there was one kid sitting with their head down. And in the beginning of the worship service, I thought, oh, this kid is just not into it. Come on, kid, come on. But I realized by the end, this kid had been praying and been reflecting and that in this moment, I feel like God spoke to me and said, the most authentic worship is not necessarily this vibrant, this vibrant expression, but this internal authenticity with me. And that really encouraged me in that moment. Now, I'm not saying that I'm judging all of you during worship. I'm not like looking back and seeing, like, oh, look at him, look at her. What are they doing? No, not at all. But I'm saying that God is calling us to have an authentic expression of worship in our worship services, in our daily lives, not just to go through the motions. Now, the next part of this verse, um, in verse two, talks about how God is in heaven and how we are on earth, so let our words be few. Now, most of these verses this morning, when I read them the first 10 times, I was like, what? What is this saying? What's going on? So if you've read some of Ecclesiastes and you're thinking, what the heck is happening here? 
you're totally normal. It's totally understandable. It's a little hidden. But what's going on here is basically Solomon is saying that God is great. He is grand. He is all-knowing. He knows what's going on. And our perspective is like tunnel vision. We don't see it all. Oftentimes we approach life, we, we approach faith, we approach our experiences as if we really do know what's going on, kind of like me as a kid. And, but God is really all-knowing. God is all-powerful and he knows what's going on. So that is another reason why we need to come in worship with humility and with surrender to say, hey God, I live my life like I've got it going on, like I know what I'm doing, but I actually know that you are better, that you are wiser that you know what's going on. So would you be at work in my life in a powerful, powerful way? Let's go on to verse three. Verse three says, a dream comes when there are many cares and many words mark the speech of a fool. Again, this is one of those verses that I'm like, what? (laughs) So a dream comes when there are many cares and many words mark the speech of a fool. And here is what this verse is getting at. It's the idea of fleeting passion. And what I mean by that is when we are inspired in a moment to make a commitment or a vow or a promise to God, yet as quickly as it comes is as quickly as it goes. And this is a common experience for a lot of people, for a lot of Christians, a lot of followers of Jesus. We have this moment of inspiration where we go, God, all right, I'm gonna be all in. I promise I'm going to do this. And then a few days later, sorry, God, um, yeah, I I misspoke there. Have you ever had that? Have you had a moment of prayer or of worship or been at a worship service or been in your room or in your car or wherever, and you just felt like God spoke to you, like he just came upon you, like, like he did something in your life, and you're just like, wow, God, thank you. Like, I'm going to live differently now. Like, I'm going to live all in. Like, I'm going to change what I'm doing here. And then days or weeks later, it's like, You forgot all about that. So much of the scripture has this word in it, remember. Because God has been faithfully at work throughout all of scripture, throughout all the world, but we are so quick to forget. And it is so true of us. If we were to survey all of us, I bet at least most of us have had a time in our life where we would say God spoke to us or God did something or God answered a prayer in a powerful way or God inspired us to really have a commitment. But are we living consistent with that moment of inspiration today or have we just forgotten about it? So this morning I think is also about remembering. It's about remembering to be faithful to God and the things that he has called us to do and to be faithful in the promises that we have made to him. When we make a vow, we've got to be committed to him. And verse four goes on to talk about this. Verse four says, when you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. And we just get a little bit deeper into this idea that when we make commitments to God or before God, we've got to stick with it. It's up to us to be faithful. It's up to us to be accountable. I remember that transition from high school to college You see, in high school, it was like my teachers gave me grade reports. They said, hey, Ryan, you're missing some assignments here. My Spanish teacher's favorite phrase was, donde esta tu tarea? Which means, where's your homework? And I would always have to say, lo siento, lo siento, senora, lo siento. That's pretty much all the Spanish I remember. No, I remember a few other pieces. But I remember, the teachers were very intentional about trying to keep up with you. You went to college, and it was like, Grade what? Oh, we don't talk about grades here. You just get a grade at the end. Make it work. You can look up your own progress report online. You can do your own research. Like, we're not going to babysit you. And that was a big change, right? And so when it comes to making commitments and promises to the Lord, we're not going to get checked up on. Maybe if we have an accountability partner or we've told it to somebody. But we've got to be responsible to fulfill those commitments and to follow through with those passions. I remember as a kid... I have these really interesting, distinct memories about this. I would experience something, and I would pray, God, please help me. Maybe I was sick, and I would say, God, please help me feel better. Or maybe I lost something. I'd say, God, please help me to find this. And this is exactly what I would pray. God, if you are really there, please make this all better. And if you do, I'll follow you all my life, I promise. That was like my same prayer. I don't know why I prayed that, 
But that was like my go-to prayer as a kid, okay? I grew up Catholic. We went to Mass every Sunday. I didn't really practice faith outside of that service other than, hey, God, again, uh, it's me, Ryan. I got another problem. Can you come through? And without fail, anytime my prayers were answered, because they were answered, I did receive help. I did find things. I did get better grades on tests than I should have. There's probably some debate on the theology there. But anyways, without fail, within days or weeks, this was my next prayer to God. Yeah, God, about that promise. Um, I tried to do this everyday thing, and it's just not working for me. Uh, So sorry. Okay, bye. And like, that's it. Like, that was it, right? And so I would make these grand commitments to God. If you come through for me, God, I promise, like, it'll all be good. I'll be there for you. And then... Without fail, I would just bail. God does not delight in, has no pleasure in the vows of fools. That means God takes no delight in this artificial worship, in artificial praise, pretending like we're religious, pretending like we're spiritual, going through the motions just to appease who? Really ourselves, only to convince ourselves that we are more spiritual and faithful than we really are. How many of our religious activities are just to show ourselves that we are spiritual and faithful and aren't actually for God? How many of our posts or our shares are to sort of represent this Sunday best to the world or really to ourselves and aren't actually for God. This is what's being called out, this inauthenticity, this tendency to go through the motions to make ourselves look good, feel good, but it's not actually for God and with God. And this is what we need to watch out this morning. God takes no pleasure in empty promises. The next verse, verse five, says, it is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. And that's really simply stating what we've just talked about. Don't even make an empty promise. If you know you're not gonna do it, don't promise it. Follow through. Verse six, do not let your mouth lead you into sin and do not protest uh, to the temple messenger. My vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? So apparently what's going on here is people would go to the temple, maybe it was once a week, once in a while, once a year at a special festival. They would do a whole animal sacrifice and they would make a formal public vow. And there was apparently some sort of temple worker that would write down and record the vows. So somebody would come up and say, I here vow that I will give the first 10% of all of my proceeds this next year uh, to the Lord. If he makes my crops fruitful, extra fruitful, then I will totally do that. And then they would write down your name and they'd write down your vow. And and it was a commitment before God. Well, people were showing up to the messenger and saying, hey man, can you just cross that vow out? Like, I can't do that. You know, can you scratch that out? Because there was some sort of accountability system. And so what's being said here is don't let your mouth lead you into sin Don't just talk like you know what you're doing. Don't just make false and empty promises to God, but actually follow through with it. God desires authentic engagement. The world doesn't need any more Christ followers that know how to talk the talk, but don't know how to walk the walk. They don't know how to live it out. And they're not authentic and genuine. We're only fooling ourselves. And the last verse this morning, verse seven, says this, much dreaming... And many words are meaningless. Therefore, fear God. And what this basically gets at, it's not hating on dreamers, because I'm a dreamer, okay? It's not saying don't have dreams or passions or ideas. What it's saying is, if you just have ideas that you never follow through on, if you make promises that you never follow through with, it's empty, it's meaningless. Havel is the Hebrew word there, a vapor, a smoke. It's what we've titled our series after, this emptiness. And for some of us, when we truly reflect on our life with God, on our faith, on our religious commitment, there's a lot of havel there, a lot of illusion of substance. It seems like we have something going, but we don't. A lot of us are going through the motions, 
are living off of that worship experience from four years ago, are living off when, uh, as a kid, we went to camp and we had this powerful experience and we're just still holding on to that. I heard this phrase once, and it's living off of yesterday's manna. In the Old Testament, when God was leading his people through the wilderness, he provided them food every single day. He provided them bread, and this bread was called manna. They had new bread every day. The bread would spoil overnight, so you could never keep it for the next day. And his people were basically learned how to trust God every day for his daily, for their daily bread, for their daily needs. And there we got that prayer for our daily bread. And somebody told me once, stop living on yesterday's manna and you need your fresh bread every day. And it was a good reminder that I can't just live off of my past experiences with God, but I need a new, fresh experience and encounter and engagement with him every single day and to be incredibly intentional. And the final phrase there is, therefore, fear God. This is the conclusion of this section. As we look at the question that we started off the sermon with, what does authentic worship look like? The conclusion is to fear God. It's not to be afraid. It's not to run away. It's not to hide. It is to have a reverent, respectful, authentic understanding of how great and how powerful and how holy and how majestic and how good God is. And out of that reverence, desire intimate relationship and connection with him, ready to hear from him and ready to engage with him. So what do we talk about this morning? We talked about authentic worship. We talked about the importance of being prepared for authentic worship, not just stumbling in, but being ready to hear from God, to experience him. We talked about singing with our head, our heart with our hands, about being authentic in our expression, understanding the words, listening to the words, singing them like they are our own. We talked about our whole lives being worship. Guard your steps outside of the temple, outside of the church building. Everyday life should be consistent and should be worship. How we love, how we share meals with people, how we get ready in the morning, how we drive our car, how we treat people, how we work with others. Everything is worship, and we have to look at life that way. We've been asked this morning to reflect, where in our life do we need renewal? Where have we just been going through the motions, and where do we need to come back to the Lord? And the last thing I'll say is this. If you are newer to church, if you are just coming back, or you're just exploring faith, do not hear this morning that you're supposed to come arrived and perfected and authentic and ready to be super spiritual with God, because that's just not a reality. What I'm talking about is the posture of our heart. God is ready to receive all of us wherever we are at this morning. Whatever life experience we have, whatever our past is, whatever this week has looked like, God welcomes us in, eager and excited to know us, to love us, to bless us, to care for us, to invest in us. So if you're newer to faith, if you're just exploring things or checking things out, or you're just kind of coming back to church, be encouraged this morning that we don't want to just promote this artificial faith that looks good on the outside but is dead on the inside. We want a life-giving faith that truly transforms us by the power of the Holy Spirit so we can live and love like Christ lives and loves us. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you so much for this time that we've had together this morning. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to do a transformative healing and redemptive work in us, Lord, and through us, God. Help us to worship you authentically with our whole lives, God, and this morning as we sing. God, we are so grateful for you. We love you. We give you all the glory. And all God's people said, amen, amen.